our two special guests that we love having here. And it's part of our Let's Get Growing series, our gardening series with Emery de Cottrell and Dennis Johnson, Jackson. I always want to say Johnson, Jackson. <laughs> this series is um, the third program we've done. And Amrita and Dennis are going to talk about what plants go where, form and function. And you have some places to take notes and I think you're going to learn a lot. So thank you for thank coming. You. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. As Sharon said, this is our third in the series this year. We did one last year on food foresting. And if you were here at the last class, you'll see that this one builds on some of the things that we learned in the last class about soil. So tonight, we're going to focus on what plants wear and talk about the form and the function of plants. Uh, plants have beautiful form, of course, and we get a little um, seduced by that form sometimes and we don't think about the function of plants, but the function of plants is really important and that makes a difference on where you put them in your garden. So we're going to talk about that tonight, about how those things work together and how to um, help your plants work to their best advantage. <coughs> One of my favorite people of all time is Rachel Carson, and this is such a beautiful quote. In nature, nothing exists alone. So here's some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. Four different areas. Aesthetics, diversity, function, and resilience, and how those all work together within an environment. So first of all, aesthetics. So aesthetics are the things that, that move you, that, that please you. And of course, that's, that's individual. What I think might be beautiful in the garden, somebody else might go, why did you do that? So you want to make sure that you, when you're working in your garden, that you think about what pleases you. And it's not just about the plants. It's about where they're planted, how they're planted, how the space how you move through the space, how the plants relate to each other, um, how they sit next to each other so that you can get the full impact of the plants from different directions. So that's what aesthetics is. Then we have diversity. Diversity is extremely important in the garden, as we learned um, in our soil class. Diversity um, is really the, the diverse plants that play a critical role in the garden. So you don't want to have like all of the same thing because that's not diversity. So you want to plant lots of different types of plants that have different functions. We're going to go into some of that later on and talk about how the plants are, are how, what the function of plants are, which leads us to the next one. And plants ha each have their own specific characteristic. Their strengths, their weaknesses, they have a job to do, they know how to do it. But the most important thing is where you plant those in the garden. And again, we're going to go through that later. And then resilience. Plants that thrive in a changing climate. And of course, we're talking a lot about climate change these days. And we see that it might be a little bit hotter, a little bit drier than it used to be. So plants have built-in resilience to a certain extent, and you want to make sure that you work with, within that when you're doing your planting. So those are the areas we're going to cover. Dennis is going to talk a little bit about this Venn diagram. Hmm. So trying to get a... Um, get a view of how a garden works so we kind of make a framework for all the things that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, you know, so the, a garden sits in your in the environment of your home or wherever it is. And, you know, there's like the aesthetics of the garden. There's the function on the different plants. And there's the diversity. Um, 
And then the structure. Well, the structure um, is hard to fit in on this diagram because um, it comes from things like the branching pattern and the height of the plant and the, how the leaves are and how the leaves change to the season and how the plant sits in the soil um, and the roots in the soil and the fungi that interact with the roots, all of that go to structures. You know, structure is the physical surface of the garden where all the biology is happening. And it just doesn't fit in a little two-dimensional graph here, okay? Um, you know, and, and um, aesthetics, they kind of guide your choice. Well, you know, I like this kind of flower or that kind of flower and uh, what kind of planting you want to have. That's, that's the, you know, one of your fundamental driving forces. Um, and you, you know, might have another, like, want to have food produced. Um, but you still might want to have your food looking good. <laughs> um, and so the aesthetics affect the function. The function affects affects the um, aesthetics. The aesthetics, because um, you choose different plants, will affect how the diversity of your plants are. All right? And then um, the sustainability of your garden. That, to me, one way of thinking about sustainability is, can I maintain this garden? Um, does the garden um, do some of the work for me? Just um, by the way things are laid out, does it kind of take care of itself or do I have to put a lot of effort in it? Uh, and then resilience, you know, that's like how a garden responds to change. So like climate change is one thing, but an insect uh, infestation is another. So if you've got a whole bunch of insects coming, is your garden doing well, considering the, the invasion, or is it really, really suffering? So a really resilient garden can survive a fairly significant insect um, infestation. Or how does your garden do in a drought? Yeah, um, so all of those things that could go wrong, if your garden can handle them well, then it's a resilient garden. Okay. So let's talk about aesthetics a little bit. So some of the things uh, that uh, we talk about in aesthetics is texture, form, size, color, the physical characteristics of the plant, um, do they provide interest? Do you have a variety or a diversity? Their aesthetic beauty? And things that add charm to the garden. So that's not just plants. That could be pieces of wood, rocks, um, garden ornaments, things like that, that create, create a story create a vignette and you can have multiple vignettes in your garden so it's it's things that make the garden a pleasant place to be that's what aesthetics is all about so I love this quote and I remind myself of this all the time every time something doesn't seem to work out quite right I just go there's no gardening mistakes only experiments and so you won't be disappointed then if something doesn't go quite right because you realize oh just an experiment. So now I learned. So we're going to go through rather quickly some examples of garden design and garden styles just to sort of whet your appetite so that you can see some of the different kinds of styles of gardens. So this is what I call a wild food forest <coughs> and if you were at our other classes you know that a food forest is basically um, a garden that replicates what's happening in the forest. So you have all the different layers um, growing together. Rather than having like an herb garden, 
a flower garden, a vegetable garden, a pollinator garden. They're all grown together in a synergistic way. So this is an example of a wild food forest. This is our urban food forest just down the street. We were very fortunate to have this beautiful mother maple tree in, a, in our neighbor's yard, but I feel like this is a perfect example of aesthetics, right? That beautiful mother tree is like the foundation of that garden. She holds it all together in, in her, and she has a very big energy field, <laughs> as you can see. And these are two examples of our, our food guilds, food and flower guilds, um, in, our, in our food forest. So you can see this is, how we have all sorts of different things in together, herbs and fruit trees and pollinator plants and all sorts of different things all growing together. So here's a different kind of mixed plot. Um, this person took little squares and it's sort of a modified food forest. Different things growing, similar kinds of things growing in different areas you can see. That's kind of a fun little tic-tac-toe shape. This is sort of a classic design in two different ways. So the left-hand side is in ground beds, and the right-hand side it's done in uh, raised beds. So that gives you an idea of, of similar things, but done in two different ways. And these are mixed raised beds. So you can see there's flowers and herbs and pollinator plants and vegetables, all sort of growing in the same raised beds. And I have that exact same rooster. It's so interesting when I saw that. I thought, wait, I have that same, that same metal rooster. And I don't know if you've ever seen wattles. It's, a, it's an English um, European style of gardening raised bed. So basically these are woven. So they take their uprights, as you can see here, and then these are these are smaller, these are heavier because they go down into the ground. And then these are smaller and they're woven in and around the uprights. I think it's a, such a charming way of doing a raised bed. One of these days I would like to try to do this myself. They're becoming popular again too. So these are raised beds with wattle. Is that an old, old idea? Yeah, yeah. And square foot gardening you've probably heard of. So it's a raised bed where it's sectioned off into, into one foot square. And the idea is that you can pack a lot into one foot. And that way it's easier to rotate. I did it once, it didn't work for me, but it's okay. Some people really like it. Here's a wild cottage garden. Cottage gardens can be anything from wild abandon like this one up to very, very ornate and um, manicured gardens. And this is a modified cottage garden. This is an intensive garden, so my guess is that what they do is here, um, this is lettuce or some sort of greens, is they harvest all of this and then plant something else in that spot. So it's done in an intensive sort of way. And this is a, not really a cottage garden, but it's a very artistic and symmetrical kind of garden and beautiful, I think, um, the way they did it with in the statue in the center. There's some beautiful cabbages. Yeah, so diversity. So planting different species of plants increases the stability and resilience of 
and the ecosystem around the plants. Um, and diversity really comes from a diverse set of functions. So if you plant a bunch of different plants, but they all have the same function in the garden, you're not really getting diversity. Um, the full-on diversity. You'll get some diversity in that um, insects or diseases um, will, won't spread as easily with a diverse mix of plants, but you'll miss out on other functions. So when um, you have difficult times, you may not get um, a strong response from the garden if it all has a single function. Um, and, um, and it's important to have diversity above the ground and below. So you can see all the different heights of the plants there. That gives diversity um, so that the taller plants can shade some of the lower plants. So, um, you can have more um, ground cover. You know, this, this particular drawing just has some open spaces in it, but maybe in your garden when it's fully uh, um, growing in the middle of the season, maybe you can't even see the ground. Um, and covering the ground with plants helps protect it from the erosion caused by rainfall hitting the ground. But you can do the same thing by applying mulch. Um, and then the plant roots interact with different um, fungi and bacteria in the soil. And it's really the fungi and the bacteria that feed plants. Um, they process old dead organic matter in the soil and convert the nutrients that are in that um, organic matter into forms that the plants can make use of. So um, a really sustainable, resilient garden, you really feed the soil microbiome, the, all the insects, all the bacteria, all the fungi. You take care of those, and then they take care of the plant. Um, And in diversity, how does that help your garden? Well, you know, it boosts nutrient availability. It's like those different types of roots are interacting with different um, types of fungi and different bacteria. So there's different suite of nutrients that they can provide to that plant. Um, and then also some plants root shallow and just use the um, nutrients in a relatively small uh, surface layer, but others root much deeper. And um, just the plant itself, its roots can contact with a much larger portion of ground. So that's another way that diversity um, brings uh, more nutrients available to the garden as a whole. and enhances the soil those roots growing in the soil interact with the, the biome again. And um, really the, the roots like exude chemicals um, into the soil that the microbes uh, and fungi eat. And then some of those chemicals and, and the waste products from the microbes and the fungi coat the soil particles and form a structure in the soil. And that structure helps um, the fertility of the soil immensely. Um, you have different types of plants and you know, draw in different kinds of po pollinators, you know, maybe moths which just come at night or butterflies, and bees, all kinds of things from diverse plants. Um, you know, I always find that a um, diverse garden is very welcoming. It just um, feels very nutritious to me just to be in, in one. 
Um, you know, and um, all the the different um, types of plants. You, if you've chosen wisely, they have different functions, and uh, functions will support the whole garden. There's a variety of functions, and we'll say more about that later. Uh, and you, you kind of create a more balanced ecosystem because you're the different types of plants, and they have and they have different functions, and they're bringing in different insects and different fungi, and so it becomes a very rich system. And when it's a rich, balanced system like that, then you have fewer pest issues because the, the ecosystem keeps anything from getting out of check. Um, and the invasive plants have a harder time getting in because everything's well established. And you get um, healthier plants that yield more. You know, there's been studies showing that plants grown without um, the availability of mycorrhizae fungal, fungi and bacteria, they may grow and look okay, but the same plant and grown under the, more or less the same conditions with the fungi and bacteria are more robust and produce more crop. And it's just beautiful. All right. okay. Well, now comes the fun part of this presentation. We're going to talk about function. We're going to talk about the superheroes in the garden. The superheroes who each have their own function or functions. Some of these superheroes have multiple jobs to do, uh, multiple ways that they can help the garden. So let's just uh, welcome these friends. Here's our first friend. He's the dynamic accumulator. So he has deep tap roots, as you can see there, going down, down, down into the soil. And he brings up minerals and various other elements from deep in the earth so that they can be utilized by the plants. They can actually act as a living garden fertilizer as well. They make the soil more permeable so that water and air can move through and get to the plant's roots. And some of the examples of accumulators are things like, just think about things that have really deep tap roots. So horseradish, borage, stinging nettle, comfrey. Comfrey has become one of my favorite plants. And you'll see that comfrey has, is one of those that has several jobs. Broadleaf dock, horsetail, parsley, yarrow, vetch, chickweed, strawberries, sorrel, and tansy. So this is our dynamic accumulator. Isn't he cute? Okay, here's our nitrogen fixer. So nitrogen fixers create a symbiotic relationship with bacteria in the soil. So they allow uh, the nitrogen from the air rather than nitrogen from the soil to be utilized by the plants. So sometimes you'll see on these plants, um, maybe when you've pulled them up at the end of the season or something, you'll see there's these little nodules on beans and peas and things. That's where the nitrogen fixers are. So when the plant dies, that fixed nitrogen is then released and it's made available to the plants, which fertilize the soil. And so, as I said, some examples of the nitrogen fixers are mostly from the legume family. So you've got peas and beans and clover and alfalfa and peanuts. 
That's our little nitrogen fixer girl. Here's our mulcher. Don't you think he looks like Dennis? <laughs> Dennis has been working on our, our compost pile the last few days, and so he's been using the wheelbarrow, and I said, that looks like you. So um, the mulchers, Dennis talked about how important that is to make sure that you have a covering over your soil in your garden, because it does help to protect from uh, erosion from rain, but it also um, helps to protect the skin of the soil. So, you know, how we are, if we're out in the sun too much, we get sunburn. Well, soil gets sunburned too. So if you have some sort of mulcher uh, on top of your soil, um, it will help to protect the soil. And it doesn't have to just be things like, um, like straw and, and actual wood mulch. It can be a living mulch, so some sort of ground cover. Um, and the other thing is it really helps to suppress the weeds. I never really realized how important mulching is until just a few years ago. We were living in Oregon where it's very dry, and we were watering and watering and watering, and then we started using mulch, and what a difference it made. It just made a, an amazing difference, and the weeds would just pull right out because they don't have that hard crust that they have to come through where they break off. Plus, it makes, uh, uh, creates a habitat for the beneficial insects, too. They can get down in there, and they feel safe. They don't, they don't want to be exposed. So when they have something, they can crawl down underneath and uh, stay relatively moist and not be so exposed to the, to the sun. So some examples of the mulchers, again, comfrey. So here's comfrey's second job. Comfrey, hosta, rhubarb. Second job for borage, calendula, nasturtiums, oregano, thyme, white clover, and viola. So just imagine those plants covering the soil in your garden underneath your other plants. Be beautiful. It creates a beautiful tapestry, actually, that diversity. So next is the feeder. Who do you think she looks like? So the feeder are plants that um, in all cycles of their growth and death feed humans and animals. Pretty simple. So they're fruits, seeds, roots, leaves, stems, flowers, and nuts. And probably other things that I didn't even think of. Um, and feeders are all types of plants. So you have annuals, perennials biennials, vegetables, herbs, and edible flowers. And they serve lots of functions. They cross-platform. Cross so they're, cul you they're culinary plants, medicinal plants. And um, what's left after the plant dies also feeds the bacteria and the fungi. So this is a very important plant to have. So some samples, examples, are um, Lemongrass, rosemary, sage, dill, violas again, thyme, and oregano. S just a small little sampling. That's our feeder. And here's the digger. So I want to just mention that your, your pages are double-sided, just in case you hadn't noticed. So diggers are plants that help to break up the soil and make it more friable. Uh, they improve water penetration, soil aeration, and drainage. So they're very important plants. Diggers are also large plants that hold soil together. So they do two things. They aerate the soil and they hold soil together. So if you think about um, things that you would plant on, say, a hillside where you have erosion, like maybe you plant a big tree that has nice deep roots. Those are also diggers. And grasses. Grasses are another um, important digger. 
So some samples are daikon radish, carrots, cassava, yams, um, arrowroot, beets, turnips, and different trees, dandelions. We see so many dandelions this time of year, and you know they have that beautiful root that just kind of holds, it does not want to let go. Um, kale and comfrey. So here, comfrey has now, what, three jobs, right? The confuser. So the confuser is a really important plant in the garden for garden health. The confuser is a plant that just by its very nature confuses bugs and other pests because they are so odiferous and they, it, it sort of confuses whatever the pest might be. So they're highly aromatic. I, I sort of think of, of something coming up to it and getting a little dizzy from the smell and then leaving. So they can either attract predatory insects. I'm thinking of specifically like uh, oregano is a good one. The, the, the um, beneficial wasps love oregano. So it can either attract them or it can distract them. So it's interesting that it serves two different functions. It can repel them. So examples of the confusers are basil, chamomile, coriander, garlic, onions, lavender, marigolds, mustard, nasturtiums, onions. Oh, I have onions in there twice. Uh, must be, they're a good one. <laughs> Pennaroil, rue, tansy, wormwood, yarrow, and daffodils. Daffodils? Well, daffodils. Daffodils are a good one to plant all along the edge of a garden because deer, deer don't like daffodils. So that's a good one. And, and if you plant them really close so they're right up against each other, you basically create like a barrier. I wish they lasted. Through the I know. I know. Somebody needs to come up with a, a daffodil essence and you just go spray the yeah. spray something else, right? And I just love this one, but but you know I love pollinator plants. So here's our attractor, which is our pollinator plants. Attractor uh, attractors use flower color and fragrance to lure beneficial insects into the garden to pollinate plants and attract beneficial insects that help prevent any one species of insect from becoming a problem. So I, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. Uh, last year, we planted our garden out. And um, for some reason, my zucchini were not getting pollinated. And I couldn't understand why. I watched and I watched and, and I finally went out with my Q-tip and did hand pollination. But I called a friend of mine who's a really fabulous gardener and I said, Robin, what's going on? Why am I not getting pollination on my squashes? And she said, well, do you have any anise hyssop in your garden? And I said, no. She said, plant an anise hyssop right next to your squash. The bees will come in to the anise hyssop and they will pollinate your squash. And sure enough, within a few days of planting it, and it was already in blossom, um, the bees came into the garden and pollinated. So that's a great example of an attractor. Interestingly enough, I don't have it listed as one of the examples, but um, so mostly they're herbs and things like that because they, for some reason, the the um, the bees and the pollinators really love love the, the um, herbs, but parsley, oregano, dill, fennel, coriander, and then flowers like daisies and asters and sunflowers, yarrow, um, salvia, zinnias, and helenium. So they're really an important function.
Next is the suppressor. So suppressors are things that can keep um, other things from coming into the garden. They can suppress the weeds, um, keep things at bay. They can keep those undesirable plants and grasses and weeds. A weed is just an, uh, a plant that has a misguided function or a function that we don't um, understand or we don't want in our garden. <laughs> Um, one of the things I'm learning, though, about things that we call weeds, a lot of them are edible. So, especially in the springtime, we see a lot of things popping up that are actually quite edible. So it's good to check that out. So by keeping those unwanted plants out of the garden, it helps to, to free up um, moisture and nutrients to the other plants. So some of the suppressors that you can use in your garden also serve as mulchers, just so you know. They kind of have a cross function. Red clover, squash and pumpkins, rhubarb, strawberries, nasturtiums, onions, and daffodils. I would put also <laughs> comfrey into that list. So again, the daffodils. There's not much that can actually grow in between daffodils, if you've noticed, when you plant the bulbs pretty close. Um, there's not a lot that comes up. Sometimes some grass and things can come up through them, but not very often. So those are our superheroes. I hope you enjoyed them coming to visit, because they have... I hope that you'll, next time you look into your garden and you see some things, you'll think of, who, what, what is that superhero? Okay, Dennis is going to talk about resilience. So resilience, like I said before, resilience is the ability to um, you know, do well in a variety of conditions and even to survive really extreme conditions and be able to come back. So. Right, play, right plant, right place is a well-used garden motto. But changing climate means we need to adjust our ideas about what plants belong where. And native plants tend to be the most resilient. You know, so if you're like making a food forest and you're using uh, perennial plants as part of the food forest, see if you can get native plants to do Oh, what you're looking for. Um, and in your landscaping, uh, favor perennials that are, I mean, excuse me, and native plants, you know. You can get native annuals as well as perennials. Um, so they are um, adapted to the area that um, pollinators are, um, have an, are an established relationship with them. Beneficial insects have established relationships with them. Um, so native is really good. Okay. And a resilient garden means healthy, productive, supportive, beautiful, inspiring in a wide range of conditions. Um, they can withstand um, insect or disease problems better than other gardens. So, and then, uh, oh, well, that was funny. <laughs> anyway, with the keys to resilience. So, we said before, right location. So the plant is planted in a way that supports the plant so it gets the kind of sun it wants or the shade it gets oh, the water it needs and it's accessible so that you can deal with it you know um, and you got lots of different diversity in function and plant species so you're utilizing those superheroes you got good drainage and water for the plants, um, and it's a lot easier to to run a, a to control water and drainage on a level area than on a slope. It, sometimes you're gardening on a slope, but you can make it level right around the plant. 
and mulching the soil. You know, it protects the um, soil surface from the sun. You know, it's quite easy to get the uh, soil temperature over 120 degrees. And so putting a cover crop or a layer of mulch um, on top of the soil protects it from getting sunburn. You know, it's 120 degrees. How many bacteria are going to be living in the top inch of your soil? Um, so put that mulch in there and things are going to thrive more. And then it also keeps the water from evaporating. You know, water's going to evaporate real fast from hot soil. So you put the layer of mulch on there and it'll keep it moist. Um, you know, if you inspect your plants regularly, um, hopefully you'll see any kind of outbreak of disease or insects. But if you have a mix of functions and a mix of diversity and your plants are like one type of plant isn't all in one spot, but kind of scattered around, even if you get an insect infestation on the one plant, the other plants may completely escape the problem. And, you know, a lot of plants like six to eight hours a day of sun. So um, keeping that in mind and selecting your location. And, you know, the smaller plants, you don't want to, that need a lot of sun, you don't want to put them underneath the tall plants, right? And you want to keep your, like, really tall plants maybe on the north side of the garden. And, of course, Healthy soil is the underlying fundamental key to a good garden, you know, and it also makes it more sustainable. You don't have to put as much work in trying to maintain a garden if the soil is already healthy. It'll do it for you. Oh, back to the Venn diagram, how you're garden is sitting in an environment and it providing you aesthetics and it has all these different functions and uh, functions create resilience and sustainability and, and the diversity helps create the sustainability and resilience and um, the structure is sitting there helping all the biological processes going on. So here we're reiterating this wonderful saying, there are no gardening mistakes, only experiments. So just remember that when you're, when you're working in your garden. Don't take it quite so seriously. Just know that you can't control everything. And things change. You know, some years we might have lots more rain. Other years it might be really muggy. It might be really hot. You might have gotten a bad batch of plants that had some bugs in it. Just know that nothing lasts forever. Things are always changing. So be resilient yourself when you're doing your gardening. Okay, so let's get growing. Any questions? I was wondering if you have the paperwork from the last, you probably don't have it with me. I don't have it with me. I don't have it with me. Is it something um, I can get? Yeah. In my yeah. email or something? Mm -hmm. If you give me your email um, when we're finished, I'll okay. definitely send it to you. And just so you know, that all of these programs are on uh, Berwick Community Media. So you can watch the program. Oh. Yep. Oh, that's, yeah, cool. that's what Ralph is doing. And on the uh, library website. And the library website, too. Yeah. You can access it through mm -hmm. the library. Mm -hmm. Which is really wonderful. Yeah. I have friends across the country who have watched it and said, well, look at that. That's great. <laughs> so it's a wonderful service. I'm so grateful for it.
I was really intrigued by the 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 idea of mulchers. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, do they typically require less sunlight than the taller plants around it? Because I'm picturing mulchers kind of down low on the ground and then plants above them potentially yeah. blocking sunlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they get filtered light, so it's not completely dark. Um, you probably could find some that would really like it that way, but um, it's more filtered. Okay. And then uh, jiving with the root systems of the taller plants mm -hmm. around it, is, can you not put them too close uh, to the other? I'm not, well, this is my second year with my garden, uh -huh. so I'm super new. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to figure out the best way to go about it. So you don't want to have um, mulchers that have really deep roots. Okay. You want to have things that are have uh, have lighter and less depth to their roots. Because yes, you don't want them competing right. for the same thing. Right. But you're pretty much always safe if you're using things like straw and uh, bark mulch. Just be careful where you get the bark mulch from because People have had issues with poison ivy coming up in it because they're, you know, they're mulching trees and things and there's poison ivy growing on the tree so it gets mulched up and we had that issue last year. So that was not fun to see poison ivy coming up in the garden. Mm -hmm. What is your viewpoint on Japanese knotweed? <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the answer? Um, so I wish down, that... I wish that I could tell you, we've been studying it a lot this last couple of weeks. Dennis spent some time on Saturday um, working with it. Um, it's on every continent except Antarctica. So that tells you how, how horrible it is and how invasive it is. Um, I think at best we can keep it somewhat at bay. The one thing you don't want to do, maybe you should talk about this because you've been doing research. Yeah, so, um, you know, to get rid of knotweed, I've read lots of different things and some of it conflicts, some of it um, agrees. <laughs> but one thing that they all agree on is you don't want to pull it out of the ground because It'll break the, the roots, and each broken piece of root will become a new knotweed plant, okay? And the rhizomes that grow uh, out from the plant can be up to 20 feet, 25 feet away. They can go out that far over time. Um, and those roots, they can um, exude... Um, chemicals into the ground that make it difficult for other plant seeds to germinate and can also discourage the growth of other plants to, that interferes with the, the roots of other plants. So you tend to get a monocrop of knotweed. Um, so like cutting it and then what do you do with it? You can't yeah, well, you, if you, yeah, so, so to make mulch out of it, you got to make sure the plant's completely dead because each joint on the stem can become a new um, plant if it's still alive and gets in contact with moist soil. So um, it's difficult to get rid of, you know, you cut it up, so... Um, one way of doing it is cutting it up and, and bagging it up and taking it to the dump and putting it in the trash. But that's not a perfect solution because in the landfill, it'll turn into methane and contribute greatly to um, climate change. Methane's like 25 times more of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So it's not not a good good solution to do that. Uh, some people suggest burning it, but that's got issues too. Um, and then another approach is to take it someplace, maybe put it in plastic bags and just let it 
bake in the sun and dry out. You keep the top of the bag open so the moisture could come out and just, you know, do what you can to kill it. But, you know, there's places around the town that are extensive stands, you know, and it would take a lot of work to, to clear it. So, you know, in a perfect world, everybody in town would cooperate and we'd all go out and get all the knotweed, knock it down, get rid of it. But um, that's a really big undertaking. So do you have any solutions as to what you can treat it with? Um, you know, some, some people um, in a really dense stand recommend cutting it and then going back and applying a certain type of uh, herbicide to it. Um, or injecting it. But, you know, it tends to grow n in moist s situations, so like drainage ditches, stream banks, and using pesticides in those conditions are problematic. And irresponsible. And, and, and depending on the type of um, herbicide, could be even be outright illegal. <laughs> um, you know, so it's, it's difficult. Another, another approach is to cut it all down and then put a, a thick layer of mulch. And one article I read said that after the thick layer of mulch, really high quality landscape fabric, and then another layer of mulch. But I find that to be problematic because you put this landscape fabric out there in the, in the environment and it's just going to break down over time. So I'm thinking maybe even a thicker layer of mulch so that it just doesn't keep coming back and then you have to keep going back and making sure it's staying in check. You know, it's not growing up. Um, look, one of the classic ways of dealing with it is to cut it several times a year so that the roots weaken and then don't get the sugar from it. But, you know, it's such an intensive effort to get rid of it. Um, you know, it's n not a easy problem to deal with. Well, we can thank Dan Olmsted for bringing it here to America because when he went to Europe, he thought it was wonderful with the blooms on it. <laughs> mm. So in Cambridge, Mass., there's a company that makes Olmsted's folly and they make beer out of it. Oh. Yeah. I, I saw uh, a YouTube the other day of someone making fermented knotweed. Yeah. Oh, well, that's something you can do, but I mean, you know, okay, so you have a jar like this. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> How effective is that? But um, she said it, it was like, it tasted sort of like rhubarb. Yeah, and it's high in vitamin C. Yeah, it has, I mean, it has some redeeming qualities, but the, the noxiousness of it just hey, well, outweighs that. I guess with somebody who's really industrious and inventive, there's a whole industry waiting to, to happen. <laughs> That's <laughs> not going to be me. <laughs> yeah, and it has some medicinal values too, you know. So, but it is difficult to get out of the environment once it's there. What about vinegar? Does that work? Yeah, it's the again high? the high, the thirty percent. Which it, you have to be really careful when you're using that because it's it's it could really burn you. So you have to wear glasses and and you have to be covered. Um, but that's one of those things that they painted on or injected into the stems. But again, it's so labor intensive. Are yeah. these stems? I'm just trying to figure out if I've seen it. I'm sure I've seen it along the roadway. Yeah. But are the stems hollow yes. in the fall? They're, yeah, they're ho you go out there right now and cut them, and they're so hollow. So why can't you just pour that vinegar in well, the stem? Well, you could, but <laughs> so if you wanted to do the, do that kind of treatment, it's best to cut it uh, yeah. a couple times during the year, okay. and then just before it starts flowering in the fall, um, 
to cut it again and apply um, the vinegar and with the idea that the plant would be drawing things down into its root system in the, in the latter part of the year. But again, if the stand's been there for a while, the root system is mature and widespread and has a lot of volume in the roots. So if you're trying to use something like vinegar, it may kill right around the base of the plant, but the rest of the rhizome network is going to be untouched and more plants will come up later. So you have to keep going back and cutting those and doing it again. It's hideous. Oh, it's, it's yeah. really awful. Yeah. Well, that's why we need uh, the person who's going to m make a killing <laughs> with um, a, a fermented knotweed <laughs> product that's a worldwide hit. <laughs> well, here's a perfect example of native plants. Don't plant things that are just ornamental because usually they've, they've been brought from someplace else and they, they just go rampant in this environment. So. I didn't find them attractive at all. No, I don't know, no, I don't know either. But unfortunately it happened. On the native plants, um, mm -hmm. so I have naturally occurring strawberries in my yard, mm -hmm. just like that. Um, I was wondering if you have any recommendations for uh, native edibles um, around here, especially perennials. Um, oh, there, this is a huge list of those. Okay. Um, if you give me your email address, I can I can okay. find that in. And that's one of the things that we're researching right now is. Um, is perennial vegetables yeah, and there there are quite a few of them the problem with them is though that they're not native and yesterday i was spending quite a bit of time looking for um, perennial vegetables and they're like from asia from europe i'm like mm. so but there are some there are some and for us uh this year our kale came back our collards came back. Now they didn't come back anywhere near as robust, but they did come back, which is pretty interesting. So again, that speaks to the health of the soil. And so I didn't, so I didn't rip them out. What did you say? Rhubarb. rhubarb. Yes, rhubarb. Oh, I saw it's beautiful. Yeah, rhubarb is a big one. Uh, asparagus. Asparagus takes a few years, but you know, it, it has a lifespan of like 30 years or something, so it's a really good plant to plant. Any other questions? With the um, mulch on the top, I've read that you shouldn't use straw because you might get the seeds out of it. Is that, or hay, mm -hmm. is it hay or straw? Uh, well, I think uh, it's mixed. If that answers the question, um, I think it's probably more hay than straw, but it's a really good mulch. Yeah. So it's a really good mulch. So to be clear, what she's saying is that the hay tends to have more seeds. seeds. More seeds. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 But I know, I have friends who use old hay, like from somebody who's who's done hay and it's over a year old and they just want to get rid of the bales that they have because they didn't use it for their, their animals. So if you can find that, it's, it's just as good as straw. Do you have recommendations for people around here for our garden outside? Um, I, I don't, but I can, I'm, I'm starting to do some research on that. So yeah, I will have that. Well, thank you all. Thanks. Appreciate you coming out. Thank you for coming. <laughs>